Hello again class. Today we're going to start a series of lectures on the executive branch, <clears throat> which will uh, mainly focus on the president as the head of the executive branch, or uh, as the title here, uh, I say America's CEO. Uh, if you don't know, CEO stands for chief executive officer. Uh, that's usually the term in the title given to you know, people who run big corporations. Uh, and essentially, Amer uh, the president is America's chief executive officer. Uh, that's why we call uh, the particular branch of government that the president leads the executive branch. Right, so today's lesson, uh, we're really going to kind of focus on a lot on the basics. All right. And I figured um, uh, instead of having a bunch of regular sort of charts and graphs for the most part, I'll just try to find silly pictures uh, that I can find of presidents doing silly things, uh, like hugging the Easter Bunny here. Now, as a review, Article 2 of the Constitution establishes the executive branch of the presidency, uh, and it doesn't give uh, very many details. The Article 1, which establishes the legislative branch. It is much, much uh, longer than Article 2, probably four or five times longer. Uh, so the, the Constitution spends most of its time uh, saying what the Congress can and can't do. Uh, Article 2 with the executive branch is pretty bare bones. All right? In a textbook, it only takes up a couple pages uh, to list all the requirements and duties and and structure of, of the executive branch and the presidency. Right. So there's only three specific uh, requirements uh, to be president. One, you have to be 35 years or older. All right, I think the youngest president, uh, maybe Teddy Roosevelt, he was the vice president uh, when William McKinley died and he became president, I believe, at age 39. Uh, we've had a few presidents um, be elected in their early 40s. Uh, but other presidents, like our last two presidents, have all basically been in their 70s uh, and even upper 70s when they were president. Uh, so there's a wide range of ages, but you do have to be at least 35 years uh, or older. And like I say, we've never really had a president younger than, than 40. You have to have been a resident of the United States for at least 14 years. All right? So if someone's born here, you know, moves to, to say, France when they're 10 years old, uh, they can't just move back to America and run for president. Uh, they had been president for 14 years. And perhaps uh, the most controversial requirement, they have to be a natural-born citizen, uh, which basically means... Uh, if, if you're not a citizen uh, when you're born, uh, then you can never be president. Uh, so now it makes sense that, you know, someone from Russia couldn't move here and run for presidency six months later. Uh, but it also means that, you know, someone who moved to America when they were a week old uh, is ineligible uh, from being president. But uh, these three requirements, uh, that's it. Those are the only requirements. You, you don't have to have uh, served any particular job. You don't have to have any certain particular education level. Uh, you don't have to pass any tests. Uh, these are the only requirements to be president. Now, obviously, you have to get elected, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. Uh, but those are the only three formal uh, requirements uh, for the presidency. All right, so let's talk about some common characteristics. All right, so we've had 46 presidents. Uh, 27 of them have had law degrees. Uh, nine of them have been generals in the Army. Now that is um, a statistic that hasn't been added to much. I believe Dwight Eisenhower, uh, who's president uh, basically in the, most of the 50s, uh, he was the last general to, to go into the presidency. Uh, it happened quite a bit early on. Uh, Washington, Andrew Jackson, Zachary Taylor, William Henry Harrison, Ulysses Grant, uh, those are at least some of the ones. 
uh, those all had, had been Army generals and then you know, ran for president. Uh, it doesn't happen quite as much anymore. Uh, any of them had six former teachers. Um, I want to say the most recent one was LBJ. Uh, he taught for a year or two. Now, a lot of these the former teachers um, who went on to become presidents, they were teachers for, you know, one or two years, basically, right when they were out of, you know, out of college. Uh, but you do have six uh, presidents who were teachers once upon a time. All right, so what job do you... Um, in politics, do you need uh, to be president? Because we've only had, uh, I read it, I think it's three presidents who've never had any sort of uh, political job before becoming president. Uh, Donald Trump was one of them. Maybe Ulysses Grant uh, was one. Uh, I think there's another one, but I can't remember. But most, maybe Eisenhower actually. But most uh, presidents have served in government in some form, or, uh, some form or capacity before becoming president. Uh, for instance, uh, 17 of our presidents were governors before becoming president. Uh, 16 of them were senators. Uh, 14 of them were vice presidents. And as I put on here, you do have some overlap in those groups because uh, Joe Biden was a senator for, you know, probably 30 years or so, uh, then he was vice president for eight. Uh, so some of these numbers, you have overlap. So it's not a, can't add those up and, and get the exact number of how many of those became president. Uh, but these are your your most um, common. You know, you've had some who were just House of Representatives, people in the House, but that's very uncommon, or, or some who were cabinet uh, officials, and we'll talk about what that is in another lecture. Uh, but those are the typical jobs. Uh, so if you get to be a governor or senator or vice president, uh, those are sort of the big stepping stones to becoming president. Uh, now, 24 of them, which is barely just over half, have been six feet tall. Uh, and I'm counting, uh, is there a surprisingly high number of presidents who are listed at 5'11 and a half? Uh, but I'm going to round that up to six feet. Um, I'm sure they do, if you if you'd have asked them. A surprisingly number um, have been six feet tall recently. Uh, if you go back to the 1800s, you know Washington, Lincoln, there were a couple over six feet tall. Uh, but 11 of our last 12 presidents uh, have been basically six feet tall. Uh, I think Jimmy Carter was the only one. Who was. So. Basically, once uh, TV comes into vogue, uh, America basically wants its presidents to be uh, taller than average. Uh, all so far have been men, and all but one have been white. Uh, now, obviously, uh, current Vice President uh, Kamala Harris, uh, she's a woman of color, um, and obviously a woman. Uh, and as we see, and she was also, before becoming vice president, she was also a senator. Uh, so she checks two of these, uh, you know, three big jobs uh, that lead to the presidency. So <clears throat> who knows what's going to happen in the future, uh, but that statistic uh, may change at some point in the not too distant future. All right. Uh, you have to get elected, obviously. Now, presidential elections occur on the first Tuesday in November every four years, except, oddly enough, if the first Tuesday is November 1st. Uh, I'm not sure why we can't have elections on November 1st, uh, but we can't. Uh, so, November 2nd through 8th, basically. All right, so the first Tuesday, and it's every four years. And basically, it's easy to know, because if the last two, two digits in the year are evenly divisible by four, uh, we have an election. Right. For like last year, 2020, 20s, divisible by four. Uh, so we have an election. Then 2024, 2028, we had one in 20 or 2004, 2008, 2012. All right. So all these years that uh, that are divisible by uh, the years evenly divisible by four, that's going to be a presidential election. Also, uh, at least when it's not a crazy COVID year, 
uh, the same year we have the Summer Olympics. All right, so if you're ever um, sitting around watching the Summer Olympics, uh, you should know that we're about to have a presidential election. Uh, also, the same year we have leap year. So all of those things happen the same year, leap year, Summer Olympics, and uh, presidential elections. Now, uh, according to the 22nd Amendment, which was ratified in 1951, presidents can only be elected twice. Now, you can actually serve more than eight years if uh, you're a vice president, uh, the president dies or, or becomes unable to serve, uh, the vice president you know, then becomes the president for the rest of the original president's term. That, that ex-vice president can then run two more times after that as president uh, for themselves. So you technically could serve uh, more than eight years. But since we've had this amendment, no one has done that. All right, so before, uh, now before 1951 and before Franklin Roosevelt came along, uh, it was just tradition that presidents would only serve two terms. Uh, George Washington retired after two terms, and so that was became the tradition. Everyone else thought, well, uh, if it was, you know, if Washington didn't need to serve more than eight years, then, then I shouldn't either. Uh, FDR changed that. During the Great Depression and World War II, he just kept running and running. He got, uh, he was ultimately elected four times. Uh, but then uh, after him, the country changed uh, the law where you can only be elected twice. <clears throat> and then starting in 1933, uh, presidents take office uh, on January 20th. Uh, before that, it would be in March. Uh, so you'd get elected in November and have to wait till March to, to take office. Uh, now it is January 20th. Oh, nah, sorry to double up there on the, the Nixon pictures. I guess maybe I should have spread those out, but so be it. All right, so the salary. Uh, president makes $400,000 a year. But that's not all. Uh, president receives lots of perks. So president receives another hundred thousand a year uh, for travel. Uh, receives another fifty thousand a year for quote expenses, whatever whatever those are, uh, and nineteen thousand uh, dollars a year for entertainment. All right. So obviously there, there's a lot of perks to being president. Financial perks. Uh, now, to be fair, you know the president is sort of expected to be out in public, entertain people, has to, you know, you are going to have those types of um, requirements and expenses that, that most of us normal people won't have. Uh, now, a lot of that, if it's, you know, if they're, they're traveling or entertaining for, for governor, I'm sorry, for the government, the government's going to pay for that. For instance, you know, if you know, the Queen of England comes to visit America and they have a fancy dinner at the White House to receive her. Uh, you know, that's going to be part of the government's uh, official role. So the government would take care of most of that. Uh, but still, there's going to be other things that are sort of not really government duties, but also sort of, uh, you know, things the president's expected to do that will probably have some expenses like that uh, that most of the rest of us don't. But nonetheless, gets a pretty healthy budget to take care of things like that. All right, what are the non-financial benefits of being president? Well, uh, you get to live in the White House, uh, which uh, comes with a chef, uh, people to clean, people to shop for you. Um, we don't really want the president either taking the risk or taking the time out of their schedule to, you know, go to the grocery store when they run out of cereal. Uh, so, you know, the government has people do that for them. Uh, you obviously get uh, limousines to drive you around. Very nice limousines that happen to be bulletproof and bombproof and all, all sorts of other things. Uh, you get the plane, Air Force One. You get a fancy helicopter. Uh, basically, it takes you to and from the White House and the, the airport where you have the plane. Uh, that's called Marine One. Uh, you get some like, things like that. Uh, and then in retirement, uh, the president receives a pension, uh, which is basically a salary for life, in effect. And it is said it's basically <clears throat> the the same salary 
<coughs> excuse me, the pension is the same salary as a current um, treasurer, or a, sorry, current cabinet official, department cabinet. All right, let me just try. <coughs> I'm not doing a pretty good job, uh, mainly because I have a lump in my throat, so excuse me for a second. <coughs> okay, excuse me. Let's try this again. The cabinet, and I'm sorry, a president has a cabinet. Uh, and they head up the various departments. We're going to cover that in, a, in another lecture. But just know there's a, uh, a Secretary of State, uh, a Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of Defense, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those people receive a salary. Whatever those officials are receiving, that are the that is the ex president's uh, pension. So, for example. Uh, the current cabinet officials uh, right now make 221000 a year. Uh, so that means George Bush, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, Jimmy Carter. All of those former presidents uh, are making $221,000 this year. Uh, when the cabinet officials uh, get a raise, uh, then ex-presidents will get a raise, in effect, too. <clears throat> Our presidents receive Secret Service protection for life. Um, they get free office space, free mail, uh, and they also get $96,000 a year for office help. <clears throat> so again, you know, they, they are expected to, to fill s still some sort of uh, public duties to some extent as ex-president, but they get a lot of money to, to help them take care of that. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> now, you have to get yourself elected. And in modern times, presidents begin campaigning more than one year before the election. All right. So Joe Biden announced in April of 2019 that he would be running for president in November of 2020. <clears throat> Donald Trump announced in June 2015 uh, that he would be running in 2016. However, just because you announce you're running for president doesn't mean you, you end up on the ballot. Uh, to be on the ballot in November, uh, major party candidates, right, so remember we have two major parties in this country, Democrat and Republican, uh, major party candidates have to be nominated by their party in the summer uh, before the election. Uh, and so there's a basically a big election process just to be elected, uh, or I'm sorry, just to run for president. All right, so to receive nomination, uh, candidates have to win the most delegates, uh, what are called delegates, uh, and these are basically people who nominate the president. And delegates are awarded according to a series of primary elections or a type of election called a caucus uh, that take place in all 50 states in the winter and spring of the election year. So, for instance, <clears throat> this is showing the some of the, the elections, uh, primary elections in 2016. Uh, if you look over here on the, the right, uh, this would have been the list. Nothing on this PowerPoint is working, as you can tell. I apologize for that. Let's see. No, it's just not going to work. Okay. Um, well, if you look on here on the right, you'll see the list of candidates. And then, if you can see up here, that was March 2nd, 2016. All of these states had a primary election that day. And all of those states, basically according to size, get a certain number of delegates. Bigger states get more delegates. Smaller states get fewer delegates. And so you had this series of elections. And see, Donald Trump won in, Ala uh, in Alabama. Ted Cruz won in Alaska. Uh, Marco Rubio won in Minnesota. Then you had these guys, John Kasich and Ben Carson, uh, lost. But even if you lose, you, you can often pick up some delegates. So you have these series of elections beginning in, uh, I think I want to say the first week in February. 
lasting pretty much the rest of the winter and all spring until all 50 states have had elections. Um, and whoever has the most delegates uh, will go to a convention uh, either in July or August uh, that's put on by the, the political party that year. We'll go to a convention and they will officially be nominated uh, for president. So, um, how it works, uh, in recent years, there are sometimes as many as 10 or 20 candidates uh, that begin in a primary season. Okay, So, for instance, uh, in 2016, you had 17 Republicans running, uh, or at least who started. But as you see in this, this graphic, by March 2nd, you were down to about five. All right, because what happens after every primary election or caucus, um, you know, one or two candidates drop out uh, until you basically have one or two left. See, this is what happened in the, the Democrats in 2016. They'd started out with four or five. Uh, they didn't have many because everyone just sort of assumed Hillary Clinton was going to win. Um, but you start out with four or five. A couple of them drop out. And then it was just uh, between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders for the, for the rest of the year. With Hillary Clinton ultimately winning. Uh, same thing with the Republicans. You'd started with 17. You were down to five. Um, after March 2nd of that year, if I'm recalling correctly, um, one or two of these guys drop out. And you ended up with just about three left for most of the time. And, and Donald Trump ultimately won. All right. So that's um, the primary season. All right. So you, you have these elections. They start in Iowa uh, and uh, New Hampshire. Whoever basically does poorly there will drop out, and whoever wins will keep going, and then you'll, you'll have them in other states. And you just have these series of elections, basically just about every Tuesday, sometimes Saturday, every other, every, either every Tuesday or every other Tuesday for about three or four months until you have all of the um, states have voted uh, to pick president. And this takes a tremendous, and I mean tremendous, amount of money. Okay. Uh, in 2020, uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden combined to spend $6.6 billion, uh, with a B, uh, dollars uh, to run for president. Uh, and it's getting more and more expensive. The 2020 elections uh, for president and Congress combined cost twice as much as they did uh, in 2016. All right. And so, you know, when you hear people you know, complaining about you know, being too much money in politics. Uh, well, this is the result of it. To run for president, you have to, to raise, you know, several billion dollars uh, if you're going to run for president. Uh, so this is why there's, there's so much money in politics. Okay, um, here's a good stopping point. Uh, so that's sort of the basics of the presidency. Uh, next time, we'll, we'll go over the president's roles um, kind of powers given to them in the Constitution, uh, that sort of thing.